Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 214th video cast podcast for the week ending November 22nd, 2023. Before we get started, I'd like to wish everyone a happy Thanksgiving, a tremendous amount to be grateful for this year. Um, and uh, and I uh, wish you the best with your family and loved ones tomorrow. Uh, Going to be a great day. My favorite holiday of the year. Uh, update on the family. This is Mimi. And for those of you who have water polo expertise, yes, you can see she is a lefty, which is a big deal in um in water polo and Mimi was down at an ODP camp which is uh Olympic development camp in uh at Annapolis in Maryland last weekend uh so that's some pictures there and let's see I think I got one more picture yeah listening to our coach go Navy at Annapolis um and then want to thank uh, the media want to thank Anyana Mariam Rajesh and Sabyata Mishra for including me in their article on Reuters. Also want to thank Akash Sriram and Casey Hall from Reuters and want to thank Shristi Achar A and Amruta Kandagar for including me in their article on Reuters this week. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was going through and obviously the last few weeks have been unbelievable and a very exciting time in the markets and in the portfolio. Uh, but as I look through some of this and I and, uh, want to congratulate the people that have come in in the last two weeks, by the way, we're going to close out our fourth quarter raise at the end of this week. So most of you have already come in. Uh, those of you on the fence, you want to definitely get those commitments in uh, by the end of this week for Q4. But, you know, as unbelievable as some of the moves have been, and uh, certainly we've made a lot of money with Cooper Standard, and that's that's really boosted a lot of the portfolios. Um, what's interesting as I look company by company and uh, both in the portfolio and some of the names that we've mentioned on this podcast video cast, none of the real money has has actually begun. Like we're, we're not even getting started on on like what this is going to be in terms of multiples of capital over the next 12 to 24 months. Um, and, and you just go through some of the names, you know. Amazon, for instance, I mean, you know, you got this once in a hundred year COVID thing. It got down to 81 bucks. I think we've got a 93 and change basis across the board. It's at 146 and, and it's like a huge move of 50% in a year or whatever, or less than, a, yeah, about a year. Um, this thing has not even started. This is going to work its way to new highs. And then you think about, it's like, oh yeah, you can own the stock and that's fine. And you'll make a double, but then you think about the way we have the derivative overlays for clients and the small amount of capital that magnifies many multiples of the underlying stock move over one, two plus years. Uh, it's just staggering. And, and, you know, that's an example. You know, you look at uh, Baba we'll talk about today hasn't done anything. So you got Cooper Standard on the one hand that's up three X plus and, and just getting started. Uh, and Baba that's done nothing for over a year. OK, so we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, Bank of America looks like the banks have had huge moves. These moves have not even started. They're still, you know, left for dead. Yes, you're seeing contribution in the portfolio, but but they haven't begun. And, and and the point that I'm making is very simple. The good news is a lot of you are very astute. Uh, either that's why you were attracted to the podcast, or you've learned over weeks and months and years how to think about investments and buying businesses versus buying stock prices. Uh, and you've taken advantage during these special periods. A lot of you came in in March. A lot of you came in in October. Very, very smart. But I got to be honest with you, as, as much capital as we've raised and as exciting as it's been and, um, and the year is, is, um, is going to finish up extremely amazing, um, the sad part is, is when we're going to get more capital than we could ever possibly know what to do with or handle is when these things are all at new highs and the biggest opportunities for these names are in the rearview mirror. We'll find new opportunities because that's what we do. You know, uh, Tom, a.k.a. Turnaround Tom Hayes, uh, will find you other turnarounds. Don't get don't get me wrong, but it's just just, you know, and that's the conundrum of the business is when there are no opportunities left 
all the money comes in over the transom. Everyone wants to throw tons of money in after they've seen huge run-ups in a stock or a sector or generally in the overall market. They feel like they missed it and they give you everything that they've got, you know, basically at the short-term top. And, uh, and when there are periods of a little bit of volatility and uncertainty like March, like October, only the super smart people get in. Uh, and, and the people getting in in the last uh, two weeks since we opened up for Q4 because they can see what we see. You know, if you look at BABA, if you look at these banks, which are going to be unbelievable moving forward, uh, the medical device makers. Yeah, this has been a nice little move. It, you can't even see the recovery. This is going this stock is going to be at new highs over the next few years. And that's a triple. And then you add the derivative overlay and you got a quadruple or, or a five bagger and like it city. I, I mean, I'm looking at these and like I'm looking at the portfolio gains and, and uh, in the last handful of weeks. And then I'm and I'm like, oh my gosh, that's that's a huge move in a short period of time. And then I'm looking at the little in, look at look at CCI. This is mind boggling. I mean, this thing has just moved from 84 to 103. It's not even begun. It's not this thing's going to be a two hundred dollar stock in three or four years or or much sooner. Um, uh, and then that's that excludes uh, how we position specifically for clients and have the extra kicker. So we're not drawing leverage, but we have magnified returns. You know, Cooper Standard, huge move, right? Not even started. We, they haven't even gotten into we, we haven't even gotten credit for half of what we think the business is going to do. You know, 350 uh, of earnings would be half of what we think the business is going to do with a trough multiple would be a $35 stock. We're not even close yet. What if they give us a 20 multiple on, on 350 that, you know, which is the multiple that they had at 146 and then they get to seven. So, you know, I'm, I'm looking across this and the sad part about this, th this is the sad part. Um, there are a lot of smart people who already took advantage, but, but I know there are a lot of people waiting in the wings that, they're all like I'm, I'm telling you when Amazon's at 200, when Baba's at 250, when uh, Bank of America is back to 50, when Baxter's up to $70, when uh, Citibank, you know, you know, is over $75 and they just cut 300 um, uh, managers this week. When when uh, Crown Castle is back up to 150, that's when pe all these people are going to start getting off the fence. And that's fine. And we'll find things to do. But I'd rather make them a lot more money than great money is what I'm trying to say. And um, and I don't know what opportunities there are going to be when they come, because maybe then if risk has been on for so long, maybe staples will be down in the in the doldrums and we'll be buying, you know, Colgate at 50 percent off and, uh, you know, Con Edison at 50 percent off and, and some of the defensives at 50 percent off and. Uh, uh, and those will be the next doubles and triples, and we'll always find something to do. But like Disney, this feels like the biggest move of all time. It's gone from 79 to 95 in a couple of weeks. Look at it. You can hardly even see it when you zoom out. This is going to be new, new all-time highs next three to five years. And it's not just about having a, a one and a half bagger or 150% uh, gain. It's also the it, the way we express it becomes a 250 to 300% gain on a simple, boring business. Generac, again, this, this one's rebounding. You can't even see that it started, even though you see it in the portfolio p and uh, <laughs> They're not Google, same thing. Um, these are all names we've talked about. Intel, $25, you heard it on the podcast. Now it's at 44. Everyone's starting to talk about it. But you're going to see some articles that um, uh, that we're going to talk about. The AI PCs are just getting started. They can they own the PC business, okay? And they're going to have advanced chips like Nvidia. So everyone's chasing Nvidia up at 500, and maybe Nvidia goes to a thousand. I don't know, but that's just a double. This thing, as they get going, and the foundries, and, and Nvidia is going to have to hire Intel to build their advanced chips at their foundries. This thing could be um, this thing could be potentially something like Nvidia moving forward. I'm only giving it credit for becoming, you know, for re owning the data center and the PC business, their legacy businesses, which takes it up to sixty, seventy five dollars. But if I start to see inklings that their Gouda two, Gouda two, and some of these other chips are in the ballpark of Nvidia, which is what the rumblings are right now. 
there's no telling. I mean, if you look, if you're a technical analyst, um, you know, this is this has been consolidating after after being up like 40 times in the 90s. This has been consolidating for 20 years. As this breaks out, there's no telling how high it could go, but the fundamentals need to back it up. But again, people will start throwing money with me after the thing hits $75 and be like, why don't you buy me Intel? And I'll be like, well, Intel's already left the station. Let's let's look at some things that are opportunities right now. And it's just sad because I see it over and over and over and people miss the biggest moves because they sit on their hands at the exact wrong time. If you're certain when you're allocating risk, then you're you're allocating at the exact wrong time. The time you want to be allocating is when you're sick to your stomach. Those are the greatest trades in my career. When you're absolutely sick to your stomach um, is when is the best time to put money to work. Small caps have had a nice move in the last couple of weeks. They're not even they're not even off the mat. They're not even getting started. This is like over and over. Uh, 3M. Okay, this thing has been moving from 84 to 95 in the last couple of weeks. I can't even see that that it's moved off the map. I mean, everything is still oversold. This thing won't even start to get interesting to the public until it's at 140 or 150. And um, and on a 40, 50% move, our clients will probably be up 100, 120% based on how we have it structured. Uh, PayPal, again, not even move. It's moved from 50 to 56. It's, it's still dead in the water. This thing is bottoming. I'm telling you, at 180, everyone's going to be like, that was the most amazing call. This thing's going to 500. And, you know, we'll probably have laid off, you know, 20 percent, 25 percent of the position at, at that at that point when everyone's just getting interested in coming in. And now you got the Nasdaq looking like it wants to break out here. No one believes it. Everyone's underweight. Uh, Rolls Royce, when I talked about this thing a year ago and it was in the gutter, everyone looked at me like I had three heads. I said the airline service hours is going to come back. China Airlines service hours is going to come back. I want to be involved. So this thing's up more than double and it's just getting started. And, and no one wanted it because the UK was the most hated area to put money to work. Everyone will be that at eight, nine bucks up from a buck and change. Everyone's going to be like, oh, you know, can I invest with you? I want you, I want you to buy me some Rolls Royce, and, you know, and it'll be like, no, Rolls Royce has left the station. Let's look at what's available right now. And it, and it just goes on and on. Um, semiconductors, if you remember last October on the podcast, what were we talking about? When were we pounding the table on Intel? It's when everyone was puking out semiconductors. Now they're at new highs. Everyone wants them. Um, you know, so we we have the ones that we think that can continue to go, even if, if the industry gets a little bit of consolidation, which it doesn't appear like it's going to get it anytime soon in the next few months. Stanley Black & Decker, we're going to spend a lot of time on. This thing has moved off the mat from the 70s to now almost $90 in a very short period of time. But again, it hasn't even begun. This stock is going to work its way to new highs over the next three to four. So that's going to be, you know, 150% plus the way we've structured it for many clients is going to be, you know, 250, 300% on a boring tool company because we're, we, we're buying quality businesses when no one else wants them. Um, and I'll get the calls when Stanley Black and Decker, they'll be like, I remember when you were talking about Stanley Black and Decker in the 70s and you were on Charles Payne and uh, and talking about that stock. And now it's at 200. You know, is it too late to get in? And I'm going to be like, well, it, it's probably going to go a little more. But uh, no, we're not going to get you in this. We're going to get you in some things that are just starting to leave the station. But, you know, you don't get many chances in life to participate in a once in a hundred year opportunity. The odds of a new pandemic coming around in the next five years where you can buy these quality businesses at 60, 70 percent off uh, are few and far, be far between. The good news is we usually only own eight to 12 companies, so we'll find them regardless of the environment. But, you know, this is like falling off a log right now. I mean, this, this you're going to see in three years when you look back and be like, I, I, I thought Tom was like drank too much caffeine or something because like, I don't, I don't understand why he was so excited in 2022 and 2023. Like now I understand because everything's up three X and um, you know, TLT huge move in bonds, right? The 10 year yield was below 440 today. It hasn't even begun. We've been talking about this 2018 low when hedge funds were record short and, and they've got records short down here. These moves, I'm not saying, you know, it's going to have a 60 point move on the TLT, but I wouldn't be shocked in the next year or two as the Fed, as we bring the Fed funds rate down to three to four uh, that uh, we don't get a move to 120 on the TLT. 
uh, VFC, VF Corp. Okay, this thing hasn't even started. Sixteen dollars and sixty cents. Um, you can't, you can't even see the blip. The turnaround has just begun. The new jockeys are just in the starting stalls. Whether you're talking about VF Corp with the Logitech guy, uh, Bracken Daryl, whether you're talking about um, uh, PayPal with the guy from Intuit who had a huge, huge multi bagger during his tenure. Whether you're talking about advanced auto parts with HD, the HD supply CEO that's that's just finding the coffee machine that's starting to cut costs, that's starting to do the right things. Uh, all of these are uh, Vernado. Okay, so this has had a huge move. It was down at 12. We were talking about it at 15 on the claim and countdown. Shot up to 26. It's it's uh, you know people will get interested in this stock at $35 and $40. And that's when they'll be calling me and be like, I remember like you were the only person that was positive on high quality commercial real estate in 2023 when everyone thought the world was ending. And now these things are all double and triple. Is there still time to get in? And I'll say, no, not in this, you missed it, but let's find some things that are available today and <laughs> so on and so forth. Uh, biotech, this thing bottomed last March, it rallied. And then it's basically almost retested the bottom earlier a, a month ago. Now it's rebounding again. Um, but again, this this thesis hasn't even started to play out. And when this thing moves, you know, move from 70 to 150, 160 on XBI and then how we structure it, it's many multi bagger returns on simple ideas. I mean, that's an ETF. So the point is that you don't get many once in a hundred year opportunities in a lifetime. Um, You'll always have opportunities to find areas of dislocation and check in with Turnaround Tom, either on the podcast or as a client and see what he's thinking and and uh, find the places to go. But uh, you're never going to get so many all at the same time. And um, uh, we're just grateful and excited for all the people that have come in this year uh, and our loyal people that have been with us for several plus years since we opened to the general public. Uh, we're very, very grateful. Uh, and um, and we're just beginning. It's just it's it's literally just getting started. I'm I'm literally so excited looking into 2024. Now that said, I guarantee you we'll get a, a consolidation in the next week uh, off of all this excitement, off this straight up move. Expect some some consolidation before we hit the December Santa Claus rally into year end. But uh, let's look at some of the things that have been happening here. This is from RBC. Thanks to my buddy, you know who you are, who sends this over all the time. <coughs> Relative performance of the S&P versus bonds, that's just breaking out here, which means that I think certainly bonds are going to long end of the curve. Bonds are going to do well, um, and um, but stocks are going to do orders of magnitude better. And uh, and that's what you see at the beginning of these type of patterns. This is very similar to, to coming out of 2008, 2009. You have this monster move in, in, in equities. Then you had this massive retest like we had uh, out of COVID, massive retest in 2022, just like you had in uh, 2011, then a little choppy. Then we got that pullback in 2012, just like we got that uh, brutal pullback in October. Uh, not brutal, but you know, felt that way if you didn't own the seven stocks. All the 93 stocks were pretty brutal, brutal pullbacks. Uh, and that's exactly what you need to take out the final week sisters, and then you just run it up for a multi-year rally. And that's what, where I think we are. And no one believes it, which is why it's more likely than not that that's correct. Uh, seasonality, uh, you, we should get a week, one week, week in November. Uh, it looks, uh, or is that December? Okay, it looks like the first week of December seasonally is a little bit weak. Okay, no big deal. Um, what else? So this has just been an unbelievable move. I mean, it. It's just exciting. All right, so uh, NASDAQ looks like a huge cup and handle ready to break out to new highs and never look back. People are still underweight, still in too much cash. Russell is probably the best value, you know, trading below 12 times relative to the S&P trading at 18 times. Uh, and then the equal weight S&P trading below 15 times. There's so much value in the market. Um, uh, let's see if there are a couple other things here we wanted to cover. Uh, Hang Sang, this thing's coming off the mat. That That's going to be a huge theme if you watch the Money Show interview that we did. If you didn't see our podcast last week, you can find the Money Show interview on our YouTube channel at Hedge Fund Tips, uh, and that'll be very valuable. We talk a lot about small caps and emerging markets in China. 
Uh, the 10-year just weakening here. I, I, I was shocked when I woke up this morning and it was at 438. And this is what we spent the last handful of weeks talking about, that it was going to break. People are too short. Everyone kept saying, no, it's not. No, it's not. They were all skeptical. And um, I'm trying to see where it is right now. And then it broke. So uh, that's the 10-year yield. U.S. dollars rolling over. That's going to continue to power emerging markets higher. As a matter of fact, one of the things we're going to talk about today when we talk about Alibaba's earnings, because we, we were able to do like the short version last week, we want to get a little more granular this week, is the fact that in constant currency, um, RMB, their revenues have actually grown every single year during COVID. Where they've had the uh, trough of weakness last year was when you convert it to U.S. dollars because the, the yuan... The, the, the RMB got so weak relative to the dollar that impacted the conversion. So when you look at the ADS uh, um, financials, you're like, oh, gosh, they're turning. But but if you look at the currency conversion, it, it's mind boggling to see that where they do all their business pretty much in China, um, they've continued to to, um, to to grow the top line through a once in a hundred year event. And they made it worse than a once in a hundred year event because they basically locked the country down for three years. It didn't have to be that way. So as so the, the point that I'm making is as the dollar weakens and the yuan great uh, gains some strength, those financials in the US ADS are going to start to look a lot better um, in relative terms, be, uh, denominated in the, in the U.S. dollar, and that that's going to be that's part of the reason why the dollar is such an impact for emerging markets, besides capital flows, besides relative interest rates, uh, differentials, and all all the other factors that go into foreign exchange. But I think you know a lot of these, uh, I will, I'll put them as XUS, but emerging market currencies, and I'm going to comedically include the Canadian dollar in that look like they're set up to, to absolutely rip higher um, uh, and certainly relative to the U.S. dollar. Uh, oil, remember, everyone wanted energy in September. I was like, just hold off, guys. Better opportunities will come. It's completely collapsed. Um, let's see. Copper's starting to tick up a little bit. That's the kind of Dr. Copper's PhD in economics. It, it's implying that things are coming back in China. Uh, here are some sectors relative to the S&P 500 uh, on a weekly basis. So, you know, I like to look at the underperformers uh, and see where there might be opportunity financials. We've talked a lot about uh, with Bank of America and um, Citi. And then um, so communication services have run. Staples, Clorox got upgraded this week, which I thought was interesting. Those will also run as rates compress. Healthcare, same story. I think there's a great opportunity there between biotech and some of the medical device makers that got smashed from uh, the uh, GLP-1 uh, stuff. Uh, some industrials like the Stanley Black & Decker and the uh, Generax, uh, et cetera. Materials, uh, I've never been a huge materials guy, but there might start to be some opportunity in the chemical space that we would look at. They're very cyclical businesses. Um, and energy just hasn't come down enough for us yet. So uh, we'll wait. Uh, oftentimes, energy has a tendency to bottom in February, March. Um, otherwise, we'll just pass on it. Uh, we still got our natural gas stocks, which are doing just fine, super fine. Uh, and, um, and we'll go from there. Uh, what else did I want to cover on this chart? I think that's basically it. Uh, flow show. This is interesting. This is the asset class quilt of total returns. Uh, thanks to, by the way, Adam and Rick uh, for sending over all the research. It's really, really helpful. And Zach, uh, fantastic stuff. Um, you know, I always talk about the last shall be first, and I'm sure I'll do one of these articles before the end of the year. But it's interesting, you know, emerging markets were the worst last year, negative 19%. Uh, this year, they're middle of the pack, plus 5.5%. But you can see, if you look back to 2016, it takes a couple of years to get back to the top of the pack. So, you know, they went negative 14 in 2018, then they were plus 18 the next year, plus 18 the next year. So 36% over the next two years, we're only plus five. There's going to be a lot of catch up. It wouldn't shock me to see emerging markets up 30% plus next year uh, and move to the top of the bracket. 
Um, S&P moved from negative 18 to positive 18. Uh, that's pretty good that, you know, that can sustain, but I don't think we're going to have, you know, if we finish up 20 plus percent this year, we'll probably have uh, more subdued returns next year, like 10 or 15 for the S&P. But for that's the top seven weights, the heavy ones will kind of consolidate while the 99 under the 94, 93 under the surface will start to participate, but it won't push the averages as much. Uh, but under the surface, there'll be a lot of doubles plus. Um, Commodities went from the best last year to almost the worst to flat this year. Um, REITs are starting, they went from negative 25% last year. This year they're flattish. Uh, I think those are gonna be among the, you know, REITs and treasuries are flat. They're the worst two performers. Uh, I think they're gonna be probably the best two or near the top next year, certainly in the top three or four. Uh, so that's going to be, you know, the CCIs, the VNOs are going to benefit from that, the TLTs, um, and also interest rate sensitive stuff. Some of the utilities that have really been smashed, some of the staples, et cetera. Um, just trying to see what's crushing it. Nothing's really crushing it other than the S and P that'll fall back to earth. Yeah. There's nothing really crushing it. So I think you'll just see more subdued S and P, uh, more magnificent emerging markets and um, and these interest rate sensitive start to absolutely rip. This shows the PE multiples of the S&P 500 at 18 times versus uh, the equal weight, which gives less weight to the Magnificent 7 at 14 times. So you can see there's a lot of tremendous value under the surface. This is from Seth Golden on uh, these wide breath thrusts. We just had one last week, which we covered, but the one from March he's pointing to, he talks about, um, this has proven to be the second worst Zyg, uh, Zyg breath thrust performance uh, ever so far, because it's up, in six months, rather. So it's only up 4% when the app, 4.4% since that breath thrust, the S&P is up 4.4% since the breath thrust, uh, when on average it's up 16.2. So the thesis here is it's going to play catch up. We agree with that. Uh, and 12 months later, the average return should be 24. So there could be a lot more gas in the tank as we move toward March 31st, 2023. And I think that will be the case. I think a lot of people missed this year's rally, they'll chase into year end and then they'll, they'll keep chasing uh, the momentum until we get closer to kind of, you know, sell in May. Um, but uh, that, that's good data from Seth. The other thing he put out is this Bank of America letter, uh, kind of looking at the year ahead. And I thought the uh, China part was very interesting. They maintained their growth forecast at 4.8% for 2024 and 4.6% for 2025 with inflation picking up in 1Q 2024. Government's efforts to increase public investment and support high-end manufacturing capex will partly offset the drag from sluggish investment by property developers. We expect the housing market to stabilize in the first half of 2024. So a lot of stimulus is going into that. We'll cover a couple articles in a minute. Uh, also, you know, some people ask why I don't short more often. When it's time to short, we will short. Uh, it's it's not time to short, but the, the reason you don't want to be short all the time is because on balance, it's you're going to be wrong 70 percent of the time, no matter how smart you are. And uh, uh, there were some headlines about a very famous uh, hedge fund manager. I'm not going to go into the name, but, um, you know, he had uh, seven billion under management in 2008 and he's lost 85 percent of that money. Uh, and in the article in The Economist, it said that the, the firm had 500 million, but uh, someone else, another reporter is saying that it's um, 200 million. So look, the bottom line is no matter how, how smart you are, and this guy is extremely smart uh, and has made some big calls over his career, but um, you know they had to shut down after losing 85% of the money. I mean, it's like, no, no kidding. And uh, it, why would you want to swim against the current all the time? Uh, you want to be very 
when there's an asymmetric setup and you can do it with limiting your risk, I mean, that's the beauty of being long. When you buy a high quality business and you're not on leverage, you can wait for the thesis to play out. And like we always talk about, some play out in six or 12 months and some take three or four years. But the key is if there's enough margin of safety, the IRR is gonna be fine. And certainly the IRR is gonna be great over a basket of them. Um, but with you, you don't have unlimited risk with cash generated businesses. When you're short companies, whether they generate cash or don't get, generate cash, you've got unlimited risk. And we never would express it with short stock. We would always express an asymmetric bet uh, on the short side with long premium where our risk is defined. It's you know maximum one or 2% of capital. It has an expected value of three to five X, in some cases, 10 X if they're spreads. Uh, and, and like the timing is just perfect. Otherwise, you know, the, the, these guys all tend to wind up in the same boat, unfortunately, uh, no matter how smart they are. And they all certainly, all of them sound brilliant. Uh, a few of them actually are brilliant, but they're just swimming against the current and there's, there's no way to solve for that. Uh, Ryan Dietrich um, says, we put on a historic run uh, in the last 16 days. So some type of pause can happen anytime. We agree. Be aware that stocks tend to do quite well in December in a pre-election year. So any weak weakness will be another buying opportunity. I think that weakness, uh, you know, uh, could show up and then, uh, and then we got a massive, uh, buy opportunity into year end and beyond, but he's talking about, uh, 72% up December's with an average 2.9% for the month, which is huge if you consider the uh, underlying stocks. Goldman aggregate household balance sheets remain strong with the net worth to disposable personal income ratio remaining near its all time high. So don't buy the hype about how dead the consumer is. Uh, the seasonality, we've covered this, but as you can see, even in the uh, election year, uh, you do get these little choppy pullbacks in late November, early December before you get the final push push higher into the Santa Claus rally. Uh, this, is, I think, is probably one of the best trades sitting out there uh, for the kind of macro mindset people. Hedge fund turns the most bearish on Japanese yen since April of 2022. I think you want to get long the yen here. Um, if that's your, um, you know, this is setting up exactly like treasuries did. Uh, and and uh, I like the asymmetry. And if you can do it without leverage and you can wait uh, you'll you'll find yourself on the right side of the trade over the next year or two. Uh, again, all this is opinion, not advice. We don't know your financial situation. Uh, go to hedgefundtips.com, click on terms. But um, I love asymmetry, and this is another one that's setting up. Uh, obesity drugs put these stocks on a crash diet. Now they're rebounding. So we covered that three, four weeks ago before this reporter saying that it was overhyped. And uh, all the medical devices and food companies got smashed. Now they're all rebounding back uh, and that's going to continue. And that created an opportunity which we took advantage of. So the stock market has rallied 63 times after uh, correction. What's Deutsche Bank saying here? Is this the right article? OK, I thought. OK, so it's basically showing that you're just in the early days of the recovery after the sell-off, uh, but there was another article that basically showed mutual funds still have record cash, so they're going to have be forced to put that to work. Um, okay, yeah, here it is. Cash levels of mutual funds are elevated. Cash as a percentage of large cap fund AUM is now about 2.5%. Uh, that compares to a more normalized level of 1%, so that's a lot of dry powder that has to go to work. And they also say pension equity weights are at 25 year lows. Sell side banks or brokerages, market targets are mostly underwater. Consensus long-term earnings growth is at its lows. Uh, active funds are hu hugging their benchmarks. Uh, bull markets typically end with high conviction and euphoria. We are far from that. Couldn't agree more. Market breadth has improved in the past month, so now the 493 are starting to play, and we've seen it uh, across the portfolio. It's been exciting. Uh, but again, as we walked you through a bunch of those names that we've discussed on the podcast, they're, they're barely out of the gate. And that's why it's so exciting to see the impact 
to the PL, but not even beginning is really what it comes down to. Uh, and this, this, you see these type of breath thrusts. Um, I wish this went back a lot longer, but uh, you could see it before big moves like, um, well, we, we need to see this going back, but it happens at the beginning of big moves where you see from lack of uh, breath to the first thrust, uh, you get massive breath and then you can get, uh, it can start a multi-year rally, which I think we're in the middle of. Uh, there are now more central banks cutting interest rates than those hiking them. So that's positive globally. Um, we covered last week why that is positive because, you know, most people say, oh, if they're cutting, we're in a depression. It's not the case. Look at last week's article where I took uh, talked about the two year yield as a signal. PC sales are ready to take off again. It's all about AI. So now your uh, PC is going to be able to talk to you. And who owns the PC market is Intel. That's why they got these advanced chips, Gaudi 2, et cetera, that are going to fuel this. And everyone's going to get brand new PCs because they're going to be make uh, the workers and yourself that time, that much more productive. Uh, and it's just the beginning. So that's exciting to see. This I put out last Friday, much ado about nothing with Alibaba. Baba is trading exactly with emerging markets. So you can see this overlay literally pretty much tick for tick, a few small divergences, a few small divergences. It's nothing more than a US dollar trade for now. As the US dollar weakens, both of these will rally, same as last fall. Um, China will be at the forefront of AI, Alphabet's Pinchai says. Uh, he's calling for collaboration between China and the US. And um, what's interesting about this is with this chip uh, embargo and sanctions, it's just gonna force the Chinese to develop on their own if you know they have the chips they'll just they'll just poach the scientists pay them more money they'll have them they might be a year behind but they will uh catch and and it's sad because it's much nicer to have an economic competitor dependent on you than independent of you and we've now forced them to become independent of us and that's dangerous because there's no incentive for them to talk at the table if they don't need anything from us and that's now the environment that's been created uh, and Sundar understands it, but the administration doesn't. G pledges heartwarming steps to attract for, uh, foreign capital, uh, vows to create world-class business market, etc. Property stocks surge with Sunak rallying 27% after Beijing picks 50 firms to fund, leave it to the Chinese to blow up an economy with housing and then recover an economy with none other than housing stimulus. Uh, rinse, repeat over and over. And now they want to do what would make FDR proud. China wants to bulldoze old neighborhoods to revive the economy. So if you can't find new places to build, just you know, knock down all the old buildings, do make work projects funded by stimulus dollars, have them build new buildings in place of the old buildings, create a lot of jobs and get back to 5% GDP. That's great. Jack Ma reversed his plan to trim stake after Alibaba share tumble. So he had planned to sell 10 million shares. Apparently he set up this plan a year ago. He's now pulled his plan because he's unwilling to sell at this level. Um, so he was selling a portion in order to fund the agricultural uh, project that he has, kind of like Bezos was selling some Amazon to fund the rockets. Um, Ma has been working aggressively on this agricultural thing. If you remember, we've talked about a bunch of the articles when he was in Europe, both on behalf of the uh, Chinese government and on behalf of himself. But his office issued a statement that uh, Ma will continue to hold on to his Alibaba stake. Alibaba's current price is significantly lower than its real value, so he will not sell. The billionaire believes the value of Alibaba's businesses will increase. Uh, Ma's family office needed funds to invest in agricultural em enterprises and charities in China and elsewhere and made arrangements with the broker earlier this year for a share sale at a set price in August. The broker was not aware that the disclosure of the sale agreement would come on the same day as the company financial results. <laughs> I, I would assume he's got a new broker. All right. Biden and Xi's meeting sent an important signal for U.S. businesses in China. Uh, a quote, I think for U.S. businesses, the hope is that this kind of new tone can translate into a new normal for economic relationship. And then, quote, for business community, the meeting demonstrates that full decoupling is off the table and that investment in China remains permissible, uh, at least in non-sensitive industries. 
tech and tools and tech. It should have been tools, tech, and turkey stock market and sentiment results this week. Um, so uh, first off, as we're catching up on earnings season, so I guess I was wrong on Charles Payne in October when I said people are too pessimistic about Q3 earnings. Uh, estimates were at negative uh, 30 or negative 40 basis points. I said we're going to be three percentage points higher. Uh, we'll probably finish close to 3%. Uh, we didn't. We finished plus 4.3% uh, with over 82% of the S&P now reporting. Same thing's going to happen in Q4. Um, so as we catch up on earnings season, I'm trying to highlight the results from one or two companies per week that we've talked about on our weekly podcast video cast. Uh, today, we're going to do a deep dive on Stanley Black & Decker and Alibaba, and then we'll get to some Ask Me Anything questions and let you guys go... Uh, uh, whatever you y'all do, I, I, do you marinate turkeys or baste them or soak them or however that works. But leaving that aside, uh, with Stanley Black and Decker, and as you can see, we covered this thing is just just getting started. With while Stanley Black and Decker has had a nice recovery from when we first started talking about it on our weekly podcast video cast and in public media appearances, we believe it's just getting started on a massive multi-year recovery. Here's a detailed update from the most recent recent earnings call and presentation. So I want to go through a few highlights or more than a few. Um, they've brought their global cost reduction uh, down now. They've got $875 million of pre-tax run rate savings since initiation. And they're tracking uh, actually slightly ahead of schedule for a full $2 billion run rate savings by 2025. So, you know, if you do the math on that, I think they've got 150 million shares. Um, they're basically going to save more than they were earning at peak, and then the earnings going to recover with the all the operating leverage. You know, very similar stories to Intel, Cooper Standard, Generac. They all over inventoried uh, because they couldn't get parts during the pandemic, and they panicked. And uh, and now they're working through the inventories. Most of these companies' inventories have peaked in Q1 and Q2 of this year, and that's why you're seeing the hockey stick recoveries that, by the way, are just getting started. Um, and you're going to see the same thing with Stanley Black & Decker. By $2 billion of cost, what, what's interesting about this is it's not just that the business is going to recover to uh, peak levels. It's that the business is going to recover to peak levels, similar to Cooper Standard, but they've taken out, you know, whatever it was in Cooper Standard, half a billion dollars of costs. So when it does recover, you don't just get the seven dollars a share in earnings; you get a lot more, which which is not in our model. And the same, I think, is going to be true for Stanley Black and Decker. They're talking about four or five dollars of earnings next year. You probably get six or seven, and then in the out years, you're going to be in double digit earnings. And then you're going to realize, holy cow! And the companies and the business is growing. Uh, and the margins are back to 35% gross margin from 27% uh, trough. Uh, and then people say, well, you got to pay 20 times for this thing. And, you know, $70, $70 stock turns into a $180 or $200 stock. And everyone says, what happened? And then they call me like, oh, I remember you're talking about that in uh, 2023. Uh, is it too late to get in? I say, yeah, it's too late to get into Stanley Black & Decker, but let's get started. And I can find some things that are just getting started right now. Um, and, and that's that's the way it goes. So probably what's, what's super hot right now will be in the gutter by the time they call me when all these things are at the top. Uh, and then we'll be buying what everyone wants now that's down 60% uh, in three years. We'll, we'll be picking some of that stuff up, uh, the high quality cash generative stuff and rinse repeat. Um, so enhanced shareholder return. So they want... Uh, so they did the cost servings. Their adjusted gross margin was 27.6, which was sadly up 290 basis points uh, versus the prior year and 400 basis points sequentially. So they, those margins really got compressed because of the operating leverage in the business. They brought down their inventory uh, by 880 million year to date, uh, 1.7 billion since mid 2022. So we're getting close to that uh, trough and then uh, cash provided from operating activities, they actually generated $440 million in free cash flow in the third quarter. Uh, for, uh, in the third quarter. Oh, I'm sorry, cash from operating activities was 440. Free cash flow, they generated 360 million. And that's the beauty of a business like this. It's like 
as horrible as their performance was in the last year and a half, which gave us the opportunity to finally buy it recently, uh, the business, these businesses, you're holding a business that's generating over a billion dollars a year of free cash flow. It's trough cash flow, but it's still, you don't have any solvency risk. You don't have any issues. All you have to do is work, you know, get them to do what they do every cycle, cut the costs that they over, over purchased, over hired, over everything. They cut the costs, they bring that uh, margins back up. And then the business, comes, the cyclical business comes back at the same time. What are tools and all this stuff for? It's for building, rates go down, building construction goes up and you're back off to the races. So, uh, and they took their guidance up um, to the high end of the range. So, uh, and their uh, free cash flow, they're expecting to generate uh, between 600 million to, 900, uh, to 900 million before year end. And this is their turnaround year, that's mind boggling. So that cash starts to gallop to 2 billion and 3 billion, et cetera. Uh, investing for growth so that, you know, uh, blah, 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 their new tools, and then performing, transforming to accelerate organic growth. So they, their goal is to have organic revenue growth of two to three times the market, get back to 35% adjusted gross margin. The analysts we're gonna see at the end actually expects them to exceed that by the end of um, next year. And then 100% uh, free cash flow conversion. So that's that, then you see, uh, margin expansion, free cash flow, et cetera. So here's the CEO talking about their four point plan. One is uh, their inventory position is healthier. Two, their execution is stronger. Three, uh, they're launching, uh, making additional investments in innovation and market activation, which is key because it's very hard. Sometimes people just cut they don't innovate and, and competition gets ahead of them. They're actually, their plan is picking up share. And then four is um, product innovation, cost efficiency, share gain, continue to gain market share in their core markets and improve margin earnings and cash flow. So basically what they're getting down to is we wanna focus on the three businesses that are core, uh, Stanley, DeWalt and, um, Stanley DeWalt and Craftsman, and some of the non-core businesses um, start to sell or monetize is, is basically the, the plan here. Uh, but again, $2 billion run rate savings by the end of 2025. Uh, this margin story, the gross margins were up 400 basis points sequentially, that, that continues to be a positive. Uh, just cutting through a bunch of these, and you can read these all for more detail on your own. But this is the type of work you need to do when you own a company. Uh, and this is just a fraction of the work that you do on the ownership. And, and that's why, you know, most people, they're like, yeah, well, you know what? I make all my money in real estate or I make all my money in rolling up businesses or this, you you deal with this. Here's, here's the money I'm gonna allocate to you uh, for your time and intellectual capital. And I'm gonna focus on what I do better than everyone in the world. And that's what they do. And then they lay off this type of work because they don't want to be up till two in the morning, you know, listening to conference calls, reading 10 K's cues, doing channel checks, talk, you know, looking at competition, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so number one, streamlining and simplifying the organization Two, accelerating operations and supply client transformation and return adjusted gross margin to 35%, three prioritizing cash flow generation and inventory optimization and four, achieve organic revenue growth of two to three times the market. Uh, so they, you know, they're repeating what they say, but they're emphasizing it, what they've already accomplished in cost reduction, uh, $2 billion uh, savings uh, run rate moving forward, and they're exiting 30,000 SKUs by the end of 2023. That's huge uh, in terms of increased productivity. Um, This was, oh, by the way, this is pretty interesting. For a turnaround year, ladies and gentlemen, uh, he said approximately 360 million of free cash flow in the period resulting in one of the strongest third quarter cash generation in the history of the company. One, could you imagine that? This is just starting and it's one of their strongest free cash flow quarters in the history 
of the company. I mean, it's just, it's, it's unreal. Um, so, uh, so return value to shareholders through cash dividends and to further strengthen our balance sheet. Um, gross margin improvement, adjusted gross margin. Let's see, 28% quarter two to three times the market man they are over emphasizing the same points over and over and over uh okay so they'll do 16 billion at top line they took up their guidance uh sustainable market share okay now focus is going to be going to remain Margins and cash generation until we are back to the operating market, uh, mar model the business has traditionally had. Uh, they're expecting to increase to have margin improvement of 100 basis points to 150 basis points of margin improvement uh, per quarter, which does imply that they get back to 35% by the end of next year, which is mind boggling, uh, Lee Quick. And I uh, think that is it yeah so dewalt craftsman and stanley are going to be their key focus all the other stuff if it's non-core uh they can exit it or improve it uh but kind of bring that down and focus to to what's most important and that's what happens in a cyclical business every cycle you get too fat and happy you know here you have this curveball of a once in a hundred year event but this analyst from uh ubs is saying chris snyder uh delivered another beat and raise been hitting on the restructuring execution so their estimates are actually a lot higher than what the company is guiding to so first and foremost return on invested capital is going to gallop back to double digits again by next year according to this analyst which is huge that's a high quality business Revenues over 16 billion by 2027, over 18 billion, and the earnings in the out years are looking at you know eight dollars. You know, uh, that might be too conservative, but given where they're coming from of one dollar this year, and they're hoping to do four to five next year, he's got 541. Uh, this is probably a 10 handle, and then when you talk about expanding margins, what that does to the PE multiple of an expanding margin business, it usually shoots towards 20 and above. Uh, and that's where you get, you know, back to $180, $200 stock. Um, but no one believes it now. You, you can see the turnaround is already in place. They're back to generating cash at the, you know, of the same ilk as they were in 2018 and 2019. And this is going to go even higher now with all the cost savings uh, and the recovery with the, um, with the top line as well. On to Alibaba. This is what I was talking about with the revenues in constant in local currency, which surprised me actually when I when I did this calculation. Um, it was nice to see that during COVID they were able to continue to grow top line in local currency where they do all their business. Then I did a chart which we've covered a few times, basically how it's had three of these year, year and a half sideways consolidation before it breaks out and goes parabolic, whether it's a 200% move, 132% move. I think this move is gonna be more this time uh, because of the coiled spring and pent up demand. Uh, and final growth hoorah in China before the demographic cliff hits them three to five years out. Uh, and then now the dollar is working in our favor. You can see the chart here. And then you can see my thoughts on earnings, which we covered in last week's podcast, uh, which I put out right after they released last Thursday morning when everyone was panicking. So let's go through some of the key things here. We're not going to get to all of them, but I did want to get into a little bit more granularity than we were able to last week uh, with earnings just uh, coming out a few hours before the podcast. Um, so as we covered, you know, revenue was up 9% year over year, EBITDA. Um, uh, income from operations was up 34% and EBITDA was up 18%. Uh, and yet, you, you know, you would, you would, uh, and by the way, they've got, uh, not net cash, but gross cash, $87 billion net cash, I think 63 or $65 billion. Uh, and you can't give away the stock at, uh, uh where it is, but that will change. And when it changes, it, it does abruptly. Um, 
they issued their first dividend, which is $2.5 billion. Uh, that's going to be paid out in uh, late January for shareholders of record. Um, let's get through a couple of these key points here that we didn't touch on. We did touch on this. Free cash flow is up 27% year on year to $6.2 billion in the quarter. I mean, there's just not another business out there in the world that's trading at this low multiple with this many options or outs, as we like to say in poker, um, uh, with uh, everything favorably pointed to it as the dollar weakens and flows go into emerging markets. So we're excited on that front. Um, but I think a couple of things. First and foremost is Taobao and Tmall. Um, they've been doing a lot of things that some of the fast growing companies are doing. They're now getting more into live streaming, more content marketing, et cetera, and more AI applications and tools to improve the user experience, which they're going to have an advantage because they're the largest, third largest cloud company in the world behind Microsoft and Azure, just to put that in perspective. Um, they, they recorded pot for the, uh, 11, global shopping festival. They recorded a uh, positive year over year growth in participating Merchants, transacting buyers, and order volume compared to the same period last year uh, continues to expand AI products and services for merchant operation, growing the, growing the number of merchants who advertise with us. And this is very interesting because what you can see here is they're kind of becoming like a Google uh, across their platform. So a merchant can now go in and allocate their advertising budgets to all available properties within the Alibaba ecosystem using a single interface. So Amazon's doing a bit of this. Certainly Google were the uh, first people to do this in scale and now Alibaba's doing it. So uh, before it was, I guess, harder to advertise on each different part of the business. Now from one click, you can allocate across all platforms, which is going to get the merchant more returns, which is going to want to make them want to do more advertising, which turns this business into a monster business. Um, so D DAUs were up 20% year on year with their Zhinyu uh, marketplace, which is um, another piece. I mean, what, what's interesting about these different divisions, so we're, we're now in, still in Taobao and Tmall, is that every single piece of their business keeps growing, okay? And, and then if you look at the digital commerce group, um, the Alibaba International Digital Commerce Group, which includes Lazada, AliExpress, Trindal, which is the uh, Turkish one, Daraz, Miravia, and Alibaba.com. Uh, this business combined order growth was up 28% year on year, driven by solid performance from all major retail platforms. During the quarter, revenue from AIDC exhibited robust growth, increasing 53% year on year. I mean, 53% year on year growth in revenue, uh, that's like a startup. And, and we're, we're buying this thing, uh, you know, at single digit multiples with growth in, in these different businesses that is just staggering. Uh, AliExpress has this piece called the order volume of choice. That's been a monster for them. It's some change that they made that um, saw double-digit growth year over year in the number of orders during the quarter. Lazada recorded double-digit growth year over year. Uh, Trindall delivered robust order growth, et cetera. One of these divisions, I can't, I'm not sure which one is, I think it comes up later, was up 73%. So, so there you got your Taobao and Tmall, your Alibaba International, then your local services was up 16% year on year. It's a business no one ever talks about, Ellie Mae and the AMAP business. It's a $2 billion top line business. Uh, was up, The local services group was up 20% year over year. Uh, I mean, and these the, the, the businesses that they do, it's just mind boggling. There's not a business that they're not in. I, okay, so their delivery orders grew double digits year over year. Uh, in the quarter, but they not only do restaurant and non-restaurant orders, they do flower delivery in for Chinese Valentine's Day. They do medicine delivery. Um, they did deliveries for the new iPhone 15 launch on September 22nd. Uh, and it, it just continues. So I'm just going through here. 
Uh, AMAP recorded an all-time high of over 280 million peak daily active users as the China economy experienced strong recovery in travel demand. So they're in the travel business. Then this uh, uh, kind of smart logistics network business, uh, that's a $3.1 billion, $3 billion top line business. That grew 25% year over year. That's cross-border fulfillment solutions. They're creating a global smart logistics network, five-day delivery service for consumers in eight countries and regions, leverages technology to remain competitive, and it supports the AliExpress choice expansion, which is big. And it's uh, um, uh, you know codependent, co which is why they're keeping some of these things together. There are other reasons they're keeping it together, but it is what it is. Cloud Intelligence Group. This is the one that everyone's scared of. So the revenues only grew 2% year on year, $3.7 billion top line for the quarter. Uh, by the way, all these I'm talking about, $3.1 billion, that's, that's in a quarter. So it's a $12 billion top. I mean, these are the tiny businesses, a $12 billion top line business. Uh, local services, that's an $8 billion top line business, uh, et cetera. Now, uh, the cloud intelligence, even though the top line grew 2%, what they've been doing is actually culling business to create profitability so they can invest in the large language model business, uh, which is the future. So what happened as a result of doing those cuts is their EBITDA jumped 44% in the quarter for the cloud division. That is huge. Um, the other aspect, so, they're, they're trying to improve revenue quality by reducing the revenue from project-based contracts that are of low margin. So they're basically firing customers. And revenues from cloud, public cloud products and services increased during this quarter, which drove the improved profitability. So they're firing non-profitable customers. They're getting share in very profitable customers. Uh, and then they talk about their generative AI models, their large language model, Tongyi, Kin Wen, uh, sorry, my Chinese is not not very good. Um, and they rolled out eight vertical models for specific industries, including uh, finance and gaming, as well as business enhancement capabilities, such as code generation and customer support. On the ecosystem, they have the largest, built one of the largest open source AI developer communities in China, 2,300 AI models, attracting 2.8 million AI developers, I didn't even know there were that many AI developers, 100 million cumulative model downloads since the launch of the community. Um, and their uh, Tonyai Kinwan model, model scope will have 72 billion parameters after their launch of, a, of a, their 7 billion and 14 billion parameter model. So it's just growing exponentially. Um, Okay, I think there's more on that in the earnings call. But I put this out, I pulled these numbers, these segment numbers, just so you could have a sense. And I've said this several times in the past, but China's digitization, forget the AI, which is going to be an exponential growth story because of the amount of compute power it requires in the cloud. Just on, so that they, they break it down by CPU business, which is the basic storage in the cloud, and GPU business, which is the more advanced stuff like NVIDIA, Intel, et cetera, um, that requires the unlimited. Just on the CPU business, AWS, uh, and by the way, this is in um, this is in dollars because we're comparing apples to apples. AWS was at $12 billion of revenue in 2016. Uh, in the last 12 months, they did $88 billion, so it went exponential. And you can see the ramp up was very, very slow, similar to what you're seeing with Alibaba. The whole country is five years behind the U.S. in this. This is changing very, very rapidly, and now the government wants it to change, so it's going to push. But even this flatness in revenues of the cloud in U.S. dollar terms, 90% um, willing to bet this is up in constant currency terms because this is what the regular revenue is. We can look at it later when we go into the uh, Q&A. Uh, this is basically where you were in 2016. And I think we're going to see similar type of exponential growth in China, in the cloud, both the legacy CPU business, which is needs basic chips, and the GPU business, which will need more advanced chips. But Alibaba will always have the most advanced chips 
that are available to be used in the Chinese market uh, relative to competitors. And Chinese businesses on balance are gonna use or be forced to use Chinese providers uh, for their cloud services. So it's not gonna change Alibaba's share. It's just gonna change the offering versus Amazon, which is not a reasonable comparison in China because the Chinese businesses are gonna use the largest Chinese provider. Um, and it also discounts the fact that there are gonna be Chinese chip producers that are forced to catch up to or one generation behind what NVIDIA and Intel are gonna be able to provide. Uh, and there'll probably be carve outs where they can still provide them some level of, of advanced chips, et cetera. Uh, and most of these guys, if you saw that the chip imports in the last quarter were up 93% year on year. So the Chinese bought enough chips in advance of this potential sanction to hold them over until they can duplicate it. Uh, and then they don't need us, which was, I think, ultimately gonna prove to be a mistake on our, our part. Um, okay, so Digital Media and Entertainment Group. I mean, th they make movies in case you didn't know. Uh, it's uh, 800, so it's a $3.2 billion top line business, by the way. The Alibaba Pictures co-produced the uh, top two performers in terms of box office in China during the summer vacation. And they also had the best performing animation movie in terms of box office so far in 2023. So they're banging out the uh, uh, the avatar of China like it's nothing. I mean, we don't even think about that as a business. That as a standalone business could probably spin out for who knows, you know, 20, 30 billion dollars. That's not even accounted for uh, in in the way most people think about uh, Alibaba. So. Um, okay, the, the Smart Logistics Network has applied for initial public offering in Hong Kong. So that's the, um, this business here, which has, uh, it's, you know, four times $15 billion top line business is going to be a standalone in Hong Kong. Uh, so we'll benefit from that. And then uh, the Freshippo has been paused until conditions get better. So that's the Costco version. Um, which is fine. Shareholder return activities. So we talked about the dividend, which is two and a half billion dollars is going to get paid out, uh, one dollar dividend. And then um, they repurchased about one point seven billion dollars in the quarter. They still have fourteen point six billion dollars remaining. I think he they probably bought more because on the conference call he said thirteen billion dollars rem remaining. So there's that. And then if you just look on the revenue line, every single segment, um, I'm sorry, th this is all the income is up, whether you look at earnings, EBITDA, et cetera. Then you look at the division uh, segment results, every single segment was up, except for the smallest one, which was flat, uh, but the consolidated revenue was up. So here is the, international commerce retail was up 73%. The reason that the whole group was up only 53% is because the uh, wholesale was only up 9%, but the retail, the consumer facing businesses were up 73%, which is mind boggling. And there's very little value attributed to those businesses. When you think of Alibaba, most people think of what's Taobao and Tmall worth and what's uh, the cloud worth and everything else is left for dead, but there's so much embedded value in the company that is not getting credit yet, uh, but that will change as opinion follows trend. Once the price goes up, everyone will start to look at the fundamentals. Um, all right, so that's on this three month and six month basis. Uh, let's see, six months. Merchants willingness to advertise, okay. Wholesale business we covered. Yeah, the international commerce increased 73%. Strong combined order growth of AIDC's retail business driven by solid performance of major retail platforms. The revenue contribution from AliExpress Choice, a new model launched in early 2023 is contributing to that. And that goes to show you when you got, you know, $80 billion of cash, you can make investments to squash your competition uh, and generating 27 billion of free cash flow on top of it every single year. Uh, improvements in monetization, uh, wholesale business, Okay, payment revenue, local services. 
All right, so we went through that. EBITDA in the cloud business increased 44%. Cash, uh, gross cash is 85 billion. Free cash flow up 27%. We covered that. And they cut 4,000 employees. So that, you know, they're taking costs down. The other thing that we saw came down was they cut, which has been a big pet peeve of mine, it, it was that the um, stock based comp was out of control. And they cut that, which was really good to see. And also, a lot of their segments went from like 6% of revenue cost to 5% of revenue. So they're taking a lot of costs out of the business, which is positive. And then on to the conference call, this is Joe Sai, the chairman. He goes into, uh, I thought this was an interesting line. We're entering a phase of more stable operating environment in China, that was good to see. Uh, sustainable growth model based on emerging AI driven uh, demand for networked and highly scaled cloud computing. Second, uh, uh, Kainau Smart Logistics filed its prospectus application for an IPO in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, et cetera. Um, billion in free cash flow. Alibaba has never been in a better financial position to invest for the growth of our businesses. We'll use our resources to ensure long term strategic synergies can be realized. <clears throat> okay, this was an important saying that I haven't heard from management in a while. We're looking at four areas of capital management. Number one, enhance return on invested capital of our operating businesses. We've undertaken a review of our operating businesses and ways to enhance return on invested capital return uh, to uh, for the fiscal year ended March 2023. Our ROIC was in the single digits. Obviously, there's room for improvement, and we are targeting to lift our return on in cap, uh, invested capital to the into the double digits. Okay. Two, invest our cash flow for future growth. Three, monetize the value of our non-core assets, uh, either make them profitable or sell them off. Uh, four. Return value to shareholders through the share repurchase program, 13 billion left in dry powder, they'll, they'll authorize more, uh, as well as the annual dividend, which will grow. Goals for each group, uh, okay, how they'll do it. Uh, okay, so with Taobao, their number one initiative is to increase consumer purchase frequency, uh, maintain growth. They want, let's see. Universal Consumer App. So I just want to get to the key points I don't want to miss, and you can read all this. I highlighted the most important parts at hedgefundtips.com, but we'll be here all night because we do pretty detailed work. Um, okay. Growth demand. All right, so. All right, uh, let's see about the cloud. Okay, so the, uh, done with Taobao, you can read about that. In line with our identity as an internet consumption platform, we prioritize our strategy of putting users first with improving platform stickiness and customer retention as our core goals. From the operational perspective, we'll adapt our user purchase frequently as the highest priority KPI for platform operations above gross merchandise value. So, okay, that's interesting. As purchase frequency is the most direct measure of a user's recognition of an internet consumption platform. Uh, Taobao's diverse monetization products can support our strategic shift to putting users first. We, we're convinced that only with more users can we generate more market opportunities for merchants. These investments will create various win-win cycles for users, merchants, and the platform. Next, I will describe our strategy for the Cloud Intelligence Group. Given the uncertainties of the current environment, following evaluation, we've decided not to pursue a spin-off of the Cloud Intelligence Group. Alibaba will continue to invest strategically in the Cloud Intelligence Group in the long term. At the same time, the Cloud Intelligence Group will continue to maintain it's independent operation to be managed by its CEO and overseen by its board. In this quarter, we saw the AI boom bring about continued growth in demand for computing power and large model services. Cloud computing is the infrastructure of the digital economy. It's a business model that achieves network effects with computing resources and a service model that features both network effects and scale effects. With the advent of the AI era typified by large 
models and the demand for AI transformation and innovation across all industries, IT investment will grow exponentially and demand for cloud computing will expand exponentially as well as creating a huge incremental opportunity. So if we're on the cusp of exponential growth, which I believe everyone believes on a global basis is true. And in the US, the two, two biggest companies in the world that provide those services are AWS, which by the way, was a $12 billion a year top line just uh, a handful of years ago, which is where uh, AliCloud is right now. So if, if you said, okay, I wanna play this exponential growth in demand for compute power and AI product uh, in the US. You'd say, okay, the, the way to play that is you gotta own AWS, you gotta own Azure. Uh, probably in most of Europe, you'd still wanna own AWS and Azure. If you say, okay, I want to participate in the exponential growth of AI in China, and knowing that 99% of Chinese businesses are going to use a Chinese provider, who's the biggest and only major competitor in China is AliCloud, okay? So they're going to get basically 100% of that growth. They have 38% of the overall market. They've got 80% of the tech companies and they're the number one in the business with the most amount of capital to reinvest to create the best products that these people are gonna need in uh, an exponentially uh, growth in demand industry. And that's AliCloud, okay? So cloud computing will expand exponentially. Uh, as well, creating a huge opportunity. The Cloud Intelligence Group will resolutely implement a strategy of driving growth with AI and of prioritizing public cloud. It will scale up its technology investments in AI-related software and hardware. Regarding driving the growth in, in, with AI, we see a fundamental paradigm shift underway in computing worldwide. We stand at the inflection point in this shift from traditional computing to AI computing. In the future, incre incremental demand for cloud computing will be driven by demand for AI and most AI computing will run in the cloud. Going forward, we will do two things. First, we will build the most open cloud in the AI area, providing stable and efficient AI infrastructure for all industries and enabling all sectors to go intelligent. Second, we will build an open and prosperous AI ecosystem. Um, da, 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 da. At the... As for our conference, we announced a comprehensive upgrade of our AI infrastructure, the artificial intelligence platform, PAI, and our large language model, Tonggui Kengguan 2.0, which has hundreds of billions of dollars parameters, as well as eight vertical model, model, models, also a one-stop model application development platform, Alibaba Cloud, Balin. At this AI era, we now have in place a full stack cloud computing system for AI development and are ready to better support demand for AI driven cloud computing power. And are ready to better support demand for AI driven computing power. This quarter, we began proactively managing the quality of our cloud revenue and achieved enhanced profitability. That's that 44% increase in EBITDA for the division. Alibaba Cloud has an advantage in terms of pricing power, high renewal rates, and highly scalable cloud computing infrastructure and application service projects. Going forward, we'll be selective about all of our products and business models. We will reduce project-based revenue exposure, which is why the top line was flatter, invest more in core products for public cloud, and continue to enhance the cloud business revenue quality. By prioritizing public cloud, we will continue to reach scale effects and technological dividends. Going forward, we're extremely optimistic about the long-term development prospects of AI plus clouding computing in combination. Uh, okay, so now they turn to international commerce. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on that. Uh, we did kind of the basic highlights. Um, okay, this is interesting. Today, Alibaba has grown into a diversified business group with annual revenues of $125 billion and free cash flow of $27 billion. We are privileged to serve and support transactions and fulfillment of tens of millions of SMEs. We own the third largest cloud computing platform in the world globally, and the deep convergence of AI plus cloud computing will be an important impetus for our future development. Today, we stand at the beginning of a new era of technology centered on AI. Okay. 
Uh, we possess sufficiently advanced resources, strong cash flow, agile governance me mechanisms, and strong talent pipeline. We're confident we can both unleash new momentum in our existing businesses and create fresh new growth opportunities. So now on to the question and answer. Um, okay, so uh, this analyst from Morgan Stanley says, uh, your remarks about increasing return on invested capital to double digit. Can management share more about what kind of targets uh, in the next couple of years, specifically regarding non businesses turning profitable? And they talk about, we do have non core businesses, uh, many of the investments sitting on our equity, sort of like investments or investing associates. Uh, um, Resources we can utilize to enhance our invest in innovation and growth certainly do more contributing to ROIC. Investments on our balance sheet that are no longer strategic or core to us, uh, those businesses need to become profitable as early as possible or, or they'll sell them off. Uh, looking to the opportunity to monetize, which will give us cash, and eventually we can utilize the cash to give the return to shareholders. So that will help our increase our ROIC. So you can see that answer there. Uh, Okay, then this guy asks if the uh, question about stopping the spinoff of the cloud is a temporary or permanent decision. And what Josai says is, when we announced the full spinoff, we were looking for a way uh, sort of to financial engineering, a way to show the value of the business. So he's basically saying, we're getting no credit for the business at, uh, currently within the whole company, which AWS didn't for a long time until they got, you know, until they had that exponential move. And okay, so and that was when the business was operating. Okay, so provide a level of transparency to investors who will independently hold the shares in the cloud. But the circumstances have changed. And right now, rather than focus on financial engineering, We'd rather focus on figuring out how to, how to grow the cloud business. A big part of that for us is to provide cash to make investments, the AI driven world to develop a full blown business based on very networked and highly scaled infrastructure requires investment. So we'd rather show investors through, through the operations of the cloud business rather than spinning it off. And we can enhance uh, value at, to shareholders as we deliver future growth revenues and profits in the future. So uh, now, in terms of the business model, the CPU centered traditional cloud computing business is one where we built up a strong portfolio over the last 14 years. In this part of the business going forward, as we said, we're going to place our focus on public cloud because we think public cloud is where we can achieve very strong network effects and scale effects and thereby provide very good value for money to our customers. The second part of the business is going forward into the future is the GPU based AI computing. And obviously there've been some major changes in the external environment policy wise and otherwise that will bring about important changes in the China market. I think going forward that we can certainly expect to see the China market is that there will be multiple different chips being used, multiple different providers. Let me repeat that, multiple different chips being used multiple different providers. And that's what I've said since day one, meeting demand for AI computing power in the China market. So this is probably the most important takeaway of the entire podcast this week. There will be multiple different chips being used by multiple different providers meeting the demand for AI computing power in the China market. Now, that could be that could mean that they're buying NVIDIA chips through intermediaries in Eastern Europe that uh, ship it twice or it could mean that they develop them internally, but they're gonna get them one way or another. I think cloud in China is gonna play an even more important role in supporting the development of AI in this market because cloud can allow developers to achieve much higher efficiency and not have to worry about complex issues around AI chip design. So I think that we have a complete set of offerings in place that's really well designed to support development because we've always been supporting one cloud with multiple chips and we have these different layers, platform as a service, model as a service, infrastructure as a service. We're able to support heterogeneous architecture at all of these different levels, meaning we can plug in whatever damn chip we need to, to be the best in the Chinese market, to keep our number one share and to grow exponentially along with the exponential demand of AI. And I think that with that in place, we're well prepared to provide great value to the Chinese market. So there you go. And then the JP Morgan, they kept their overweight 
on the stock, even as everyone downgraded it. They did take their price target down, uh, but uh, they liked the from 150 to 125, by the way, and then at 125, they'll take it back up to 150 and then to 175, like the same old game. Uh, all right, so they liked better than expected margins in the past few quarters in, indicate management increasing focus on return on investment, which bodes well for better than feared impact from investment activities. And two, the acceleration of the international retail e-commerce growth indicates that AliExpress choice is a highly efficient business model and likely to become a new growth driver for international commerce and Kai now 21% of revenue collectively in 3Q maintain overweight. Commitment to improve capital management uh, highlighted uh, to improve return on invested capital to double digits, to invest core businesses for future growth through technology, international expansion, three monetize non-core assets with 67 billion in equity and other investments as well as low return generating businesses. I mean, that's mind boggling, $67 billion in equity and other investments that like basically get zero credit on the balance sheet. Um, and four to enhance shareholder return, including annual dividend of $1 per ADS announced for the year, share buyback. Uh, and we think the pace of buyback may accelerate in coming quarters. Uh, investment in core business likely more efficient than feared. Continue to invest in innovation and growth in its core business, improve profitability and divide drive return on invested capital to double digit percent levels in the next few years. By the way, this is this sounds like um, Cooper Standard when we got involved at $5.50. Remember, we were talking about management's plan to get uh, return on investment capital double digits back to double digits, and now they're well on their way. Same thing will be true with Alibaba. Um, Taobao and Tmall adjusted EBITDA margin continue to improve from 43% to 48% and further improvement in um, in profitability. So a lot to cover there, but it's a, you know, it's a meaningful, um, opportunity and, um, and you got to know what you're, what you're doing and you got to know all the details. So seeing CNN fear and greed sentiments getting a little bit more, but it's nowhere near extreme where we would start to get nervous, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we covered this a little bit in the beginning. If you're coming in as an investor, we're going to wrap up this round by the end of this week. Um, and then, um, you know, we'll, I'm sure we'll reopen in Q1 at some point, but, uh, you know, for, for my money, uh, this is the best six months of the year in November through May. Uh, you, you want to try to, uh, take advantage if you're on the fence and those of you who have already come in, we're ready to rock and roll. Awesome stuff and welcome. Uh, moving along, uh, earnings we covered this. I just wanted to touch on looking at what's going to drive earnings growth next year. Uh, energy is going to be the worst performer, materials, and then the best performers are going to be consumer discretionary communication services and industrials. Uh, and those are where people are generally avoiding, like, you, and you look at the top holdings of discretionary. Uh, we've got Amazon, Tesla, yeah, I mean, that's, that's for someone else to do. McDonald's, you couldn't give it away a month ago, now everyone wants it. Uh, Home Depot, people are puking out because of the guidance was a little bit weak. That'll probably be an opportunity, but we have that expressed through Stanley Black & Decker already. Uh, Nike, same thing. You can't give it away. Starbucks has been beaten down. Same with Lowe's. Uh, booking, I haven't looked at lately, but I think that's beaten down uh, and so on. So there are a lot of things to do. Communication services, uh, Meta, uh, Alphabet, we have uh, from much lower levels. Disney, we have from lower levels. Uh, AT&T, eh, it'll probably work, but that's a hairy one. If you have to take one of these dog stocks, take Verizon. Uh, and then Charter and Comcast, you can't give those away. Maybe worth a look, but I don't love that business. All right, on to the questions of the week. We've got uh, uh, Felipe Andrew Pinko. So I'm curious about your take on Top Golf Callaway especially as an investor and a golf player, it seems like the risk has been priced lower than ever before as the stock is at a year low. The stock seems to be at a year low, indicating the risk might be at its lowest point. Their significant CapEx investments in these driving ranges seem to be causing pain. As golf enthusiasts, do you think PGA and Live Merger and continued Netflix shows can increase demand? Your insights as an investor and golf player would be valuable. Thanks again for the newsletter uh, spreading the word among family and friends. Thank you for sharing, Philippe. Um, you know, this is, uh, I do think there's something to 
be said for uh, the Top Golf. I also think that this was a point in time when people worked from home. And, you know, let's face it, the vast majority of people are employees. They don't run their own businesses. And now employers want them back to work. So I think that the demographics are certainly good with millennials in their early 30s and having money and everything. So golf is on a permanent improvement in terms of interest and demand. But it's never going to go back to what it was from 2000 to 2003, in my humble opinion, because, um, you know, that remote work from home and free money from the government and uh, free time and all that stuff I, I, and Zoom calls, that's a thing of the past. People want in-person calls, in-person meetings, in-office uh, work uh, for the most part, and that's going to crimp the amount of demand. Now, that said, let's just take a look at the financials before we you know, deal in anecdotal guesses. Um, but this has always been a horrible business, um, even when it was, you know, I think Callaway was ELY or whatever it was. Oh, that was that was its old ticker. Um, all right, so it's down from thirty-seven to ten. And let's take a look at some of the financials here. Get rid of this thing. All right. Um, all right. So MODG. All right. So it's got a decent amount of debt. Good revenue growth, earnings power is not really there. Let's take a look at the growth. Oh, unfortunately, got to make this a little bit smaller because of the screencast. All right, that should work. All right, so revenues continue to grow. That's good. Operating income trailed a little bit. Earnings are kind of anemic. Let's take a look at the balance sheet. They've got 330 million of cash and they've got 1.5 billion of debt. Cash flow. All right. Operating cash flow is pretty good. Investing, they spend a ton on CapEx, probably for those um, driving ranges. And free cash flow is negative. I don't like negative free cash flow businesses. Um, let's see what their historic capital efficiency. Yeah, I mean, it's never been a great quality business. It's kind of a single compounder. Um, let's see if I pulled that one. Yeah, it's just never had huge earnings power, but it's trading down at 10 bucks. So, you know, you are seeing anecdotes where, you know, areas where they overexpanded and they're dumping these $85 billion driving ranges for big discounts, like in Baltimore. I don't know who was head of operations that authorized a driving range in the middle of Baltimore, but if you've ever been to Baltimore, you probably think twice about doing that. Um, <sighs> you know, 
this is a tough one because it's come down a lot. It's still generating some cash. Well, it, it was negative free cash flow, so that's not good. But it's growing top line. The question is, it's very hard to understand how much they overbuilt and what's going to be the settle rate for where golf demand and golf usage falls. So there might be more people that like golf now, but you know, the same amount of people that can actually play during the weekdays as before COVID, uh, which is limited, and then the weekends will be busy, and then you know, all the private clubs have waiting lists. So people get tired of playing six hour rounds at a public golf course. Uh, I do think that there is something to be said for the Netflix effect. I did watch that new uh, tournament that they had in Las Vegas with the Formula One guys. Uh, that was kind of like watching paint dry. I was reading a book on my iPhone while that was you know, going. I mean, there were a couple good shots from Tony Finau and uh, but um, th this is I would say I would say this. Um, I always tell people never invest on the basis of politics. I would also say never invest on the basis of hobbies. And I'm going to stick to that because uh, it's you probably have a decent margin of safety, but this is never going to be a world beater. And the equipment business is terrible. So uh, I'm going to say I like I think you're probably right for a trade and, you know, maybe take it back up to 25 or 20 if you're lucky. Um, but I don't like this business long term. It's just a low quality business, even though Top Golf will probably be great and Callaway makes good equipment and I love golf. And I think more people love golf now and will continue to love golf than did, you know, in 2019. But um, it's not a great business um, as far as I can see. All right. So, Jason. Uh, no specific. While the podcast and video cast are exceptional, I also want to point out the outstanding content, outstanding content in the commentary that comes out the day before. This week's edition is so packed and really highlights the amount of work that goes into each edition. Thank you for all your hard work. The education I've received over the past one and a half years is really priceless. It has encouraged me to drastically improve my reading and dig deeper into topics I don't understand. My investment process has significantly changed. I just want you to know that the hard work is noticed and appreciated. We'll continue to trumpet your site. Oh, thank you, Jason. That's very kind. Jason Reed, San Antonio, Texas. I appreciate that very much. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Chad Lamborn, thoughts on in mode. I N M D. Love the show. Do the work and then golfing. Exclamation point. Exactly. All right. I N N. Not at Top Golf. Uh, on the on the golf course. All right. I got to get my walking into. Uh, although now it's just gotten too cold. Although some nutty. Folks are going out for this turkey shoot on Saturday. And I looked at the weather. It's going to be like 30 degrees. They're like, hey, you want to play? I'm like, I don't know. I'll probably wind up doing it, but that's that's kind of nutty. All right. Um, I-N-M-D. All right. So they manufacture minimally and non-invasive aesthetic medical products. Uh, rejuvenate the skin's appearance through the body and face reshaping and tightening, wrinkle reduction, treatment of acne, cellulite, leg veins. Okay, so this probably got battered with all of the medical device stocks, whether they were related to um, GLP-1s or not. And the thing about this type of company is you really have to know the competitive landscape because I could say, oh, it looks good, but there's some company that has a brand new cellulite sucker and it just puts them completely out of business, you know, like Align with the teeth. Align has a moat, but there are like tons of copies out there. So it's very hard to really understand if they maintain that moat or they don't. And um, you're just kind of hoping. And it, sometimes the stocks fall far enough that even if their moat is eroding, you'll still get a double or triple out of it. And that's that's perfectly fine. But as this as it relates to this so this company uh looks like it has everything working for them their revenues just continue to grow and gallop um their earnings same thing their balance sheet is probably good 130 million what's their debt look like 
basically nada cash flow from operations keeps growing. All right, so, and what's the free cash flow look like? Yeah, I mean, it's been flattish the last few years, but it's still, I think a business like this, um, once you could get your arms around the product and be relatively certain that there's no major competition that's going to wipe them off the face of the map uh, and just take them out of business, um, there's probably a decent enough margin of safety at these levels or near these levels for a trade, but you really have to understand the product. So I just gave you a little quantitative nod, but you've got to do the qualitative work and that takes a lot of time. Uh, so please do it because I think you may have an interesting stock here over the next few few couple of years. Uh, Lucas Thorbeck, what is the most hated area of the market after Chinese equities? I would argue network infrastructure is currently top on the list. Everything down across the board because of market short-sightedness, I guess. Yes, higher interest rates are bad and customers over ordered during COVID and have to work through that inventory. However, the market treats the sector like it would all go down the drain and AI applications will be delivered to the end users directly through the pipe dream, not actual networks. Highest quality is probably Cisco, then Ubiquity, but you can take your pick according to size of the company. Smaller ones trade like they're bankrupt. Any top picks in this category, Lucas? Um, I don't have any in this category, but I'll take a look at Cisco and Ubiquity because um, I did saw, see Cisco got hammered on that uh, weird guidance which probably brought the whole group down. And, you know, you don't get a ton of opportunities to buy quality businesses like this marked down. This is an interesting one also, like Intel. It's kind of been doing this consolidation for 20 years after, you know, doing basically a hundred bagger in the late nineties. It might be ready to break out and then who knows um, where the upside is, but let's just take a look at the financials first. Um, all right, so they had some flatness. Revenue seemed to be reaccelerating. Cash flows seems to be reaccelerating. Always had a high return on capital, high return on equity. Uh, what are their margins doing? All right, let's pull it up here. What is Cisco trading at? $48 and CSCO. -C 12 times next year's earnings. Uh, free cash flow is down a little bit, but not anything worrisome. Revenues keep growing. Yeah, I think people just got really worried about that um, that quarter. So I would look into that. I think that this is going to be a good stock to own for the long term. I'm just not sure that it's time yet. I think that that probably needs to shake out a little bit more before you buy Intel. I'm sorry, um, Cisco. Actually, it looks like it's setting up for at least a short term trade. Um, if you take a long view, you could probably buy some here. Um, but I'm not Yeah, I kind of like this one. I think, I, I mean, you know, Lucas. Um, it's not, it's an okay trade is, is, is what I can say about it. I, I, I want, I would love it to be down more for me to like, but more means probably like mid to low 40s. I don't think you're going to get much, much more than that. And then I'd probably load up for the long term. So, I, 
you're in the neighborhood. I, I think as you look three years out, this is going to be on all all time highs. I, I I think there are a bunch of these like Intel and Cisco that look a lot like Microsoft did, like old tech, like Microsoft did in 2013 after it had been consolidating sideways for, um, you know, after a 30 bagger, it consolidated sideways for like 13 years and then it just went exponential. I do think that like that you've got um, Intel doing the same thing, you have Cisco doing the same thing, and you had Oracle. I think Oracle might have already moved though. Yeah, Oracle's already broken out. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of interested. The way we played it is through Intel. So um, I would I would be interested in Cisco. I, I like everything you're saying about it. I just think it probably goes a little lower before it goes higher. Like I'd probably put an alert at 40, which will never get hit. But if it did, then I would start to look at, you know, buying for the long term. David Perella, turn around Tom, my new favorite nickname. I was wondering if you could explain your thesis again on why you think the US dollar will continue to weaken in 2024. Also, Christmas time is coming up. I was thinking about asking for a subscription to a stock market analytics website. I use, see you use Ticker and Coifin a lot on the video cast. I was wondering if you had a favorite website you would recommend. Thanks for all your hard work. Um, all right, so David, uh, the dollar we've covered a million times. It was initially, we, st we started that um, thesis actually last October, uh, September and October when the dollar peaked. So what you've seen of late which has gotten people faked out um, is a counter trend rally. So this was when we were right in here and it went a little against us before it collapsed uh, was what we were talking about that peaking on the basis of commercial positioning on the basis of the Fed, um, you know, as we got closer to the end of the tightening cycle, uh, we would probably be among the first to pause, which we did in July. Uh, and then you, you had these counter trend moves on the debt ceiling and shutting down the government. And now that's rolling over. So I think you're kind of in an environment. I don't know if it's like this environment in 2002, 2003, where you get these fake counter trend moves and a, and a multi year downtrend, which would line up with the 2003 to 2007 thesis we had on the um, money show presentation, or if it's more subdued like a 2018 type of situation where you just get a drop down here to maybe 95 90 which is more than enough to get you know alibaba up double and plus uh and emerging markets up double and plus um <clears throat> but we'll re remain open-minded i mean the other issue is going to be um interest rate differential uh as some of the other countries have higher interest rates uh, they're going to track more capital, which will also put further pressure. And then, you know, you got our balance sheet is not the greatest balance sheet. So, um, you know, be, that's going to be taken into account as it relates to the U.S. dollar. So there are a number of factors. But the most important one in terms of predicting the inflection last year was positioning, which is one of our key uh, aspects that we use in our kind of we're top down and bottom up type of investors. Um, and that that played out in spades. And then uh, similarly, this fall, when every week we were just saying, this is a counter trend move, here's why, um, here's the positioning, this is gonna break, and then boom, all of a sudden, you know, from five to 4.38 this morning, uh, and probably gonna work its way lower over the next few months and beyond, uh, that'll, be, that'll be a good thing. So, um, so that's that. As far as all these websites are fine, you know, the key that I'm trying to find is the one that has perfect data so I don't have to double check it every time. I'm trying this one now today called um, Stratosphere. Um, they use Capital IQ, S&P Capital IQ data, so it's a little bit better. I think the setup's a little bit nicer, but I, I still have to double check all the data and it just is what it is. Uh, Ivor Barry. Thoughts on funeral stocks. Wow, what, an, what a way to end. This is the <laughs> yeah, last question. Looking at carriage services in particular, thoughts. Um, okay, so carriage services. Oh, I didn't do uh, Ubiquity Networks. Let me take a look at Ubiquity because that one might be down enough. U-B-N-T. No, U. 
UI. Okay. All right, so that's down from 389 to 100. It's a good start. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at Ubiquity Networks. Revenues keep growing, cash flow keeps growing, earnings keep growing. Well, if they took a huge hit in 2022, they dropped about a third and they seem to be slowly climbing their way back up. They're paying a dividend. Revenues look good. Margins are under pressure. That's a problem for a growth stock. Uh, disappointed earnings per share. Repair disruption in the supply. So they had supply chain disruption. All right, let's take a look here. UI. All right, so forward P is 15. What's the earnings growth look like? Double digit earnings growth. Um, yeah, see, that's where they got massively hit last year, but now they seem to be rebounding out of it. Balance sheet, liabilities, billion dollars of debt, and how much cash? $100 million of cash. Okay, so they got a little leverage issue. People, ah, that's probably another reason it sold off because of uh, people were worried about rates, but now rates are going down. So a lot of that fear is going to come out. Um, Cash flow, free cash flow. That was negative. Let me see. Uh, cash from operating. So people are worried about the debt. Uh, you'd have to look at the covenants, see when these things come due. Because if they don't have to refinance for a couple of years, then it's a non issue. If they've got everything coming due next year, it is a big issue. And that's probably why the stock could be down. Um, so their cash flow is having some issues in the short term. That's what's got everyone nervous. Um, yeah, this one definitely looks like this is this is one worth putting in more effort but you, you what you have to do is go back over the last eight quarters and go through the earnings call the earnings presentations kind of like i did with just this one quarter for uh stanley black and decker and alibaba today uh go back through eight quarters understand their competitive advantages understand their moat um this should probably start to bottom uh it's somewhere around 100 bucks um it's just getting too cheap unless there's something competitively that's going to destroy them um it's probably worth a different look the only thing that worries me about this one a lot less than cisco a lot more than uh it would putting money to work in cisco is when you get one of these things so this was basically you know uh, 50 bagger in eight years and now it's down 66 percent what worries me about these is sometimes when they break they they just they break forever like they'll go all the way back down uh, it's a busted growth stock so it's going to take an awful long time to rebuild institutional sponsorship so you'd really have to dig in and do the work and understand the product understand the orders do some channel checks um Everything looks decent at face value from a quantitative point of view, but now you got to do the qualitative, which is going to be a, a decent amount of work before I would put capital into this. Uh, or you just wait for Cisco to come down a, a bit lower. So, all right, let's uh, let's do Dr. Death's uh, question about carriage services, CVS, CSV, I guess, CSV. 
it's ESV. One deals with health, one deals with death. All right, down from 64 to 20. I'm assuming this is like a funeral home roll up or something like that. Funeral and cemetery services. Funeral home, da -da -da. caskets. Yeah, you know, the only problem is a lot more people are getting cremated. Uh, so you have the secular headwinds, but you do have a lot of older folks uh, that will be using these services. Let's take a look at the business. Low PE, but I think this stock, I think this company's always had a low PE because their growth rate is pretty anemic. Um, yeah, it's not great business, but it's come down a lot. So revenues are just slowly climbing, making two bucks a share. What's this trading at? 22 bucks. Balance sheet, $1.7 million of cash. How much debt? Whoa. All right, so this is where you have to check the numbers in the public filings. I mean, it's showing $584 million of debt and $1 million of cash. If that's true, I wouldn't touch it. I don't think that's gonna be true, but um, just cross-reference that. Um, That can't be true. Free cash flow. Yeah, no, that doesn't seem like there's any possible way that could be true. Let's see. Financing activities. They paid off $91 million of debt and they issued 100. Okay, so they rolled the debt. they did an acquisition. Um, yeah, I mean, this is generally not a great business. But I definitely see your point about it being down enough to take a look. Um, the thing about this is if you buy it at 22, you're probably gonna get a bounce to 35. I don't know if that's gonna take you three months or two years, um, but it's kind of just a trade. And then what do you do if you're stuck in this thing and it goes to 15 or 13 before it goes to 30? I, I just think there are better uses of capital. It's an okay business. It's probably going to be an okay trade or an investment, but I don't love it. And, um, you know, it's interesting. It's like, it's, it's good that we're going through this because there's a quantitative analysis where you can look at the numbers with no experience in the business or cycles or seeing different things happen through, you know, uh, many years. And, go into a business on the basis of quantitative data, which is what, you know, AI might do, um, and just get your head handed to you because you don't have the context and all the moving parts and, and all of the intangible knowledge uh, and experience of what makes a good business and a good stock and a good institutional sponsorship and all, all these different factors that go into consideration. Um, uh, some of which we don't cover, uh, a lot of which we do, um, where, you know, the good is the enemy of the better is the enemy of the best. And I think this is probably a good idea, but it's not a good use of capital because there are other things that are better slam dunks that um, you can sit in with such a beautiful margin of safety and not worry about it. 
Uh, and then the, your only issue is whether it's a double or triple in 12 months or 36 months, and that just impacts the IRR versus something like this where you could get some exotic, it's not a good enough business that you can't expect some type of exogenous event to just throw this thing to $8 for a while. Like, you know, like weird things happen to low quality businesses uh, and this would qualify. And I'm not saying it will, because I think there's more likely this thing shoots back up to 35, maybe even 40 over the next couple of years. But I don't have that level of confidence in the quality of business and the secular trends that I, I would want to participate. But I do like your thinking framework and I and I think it's a pretty good idea. It just might be the en enemy of a better idea and a better use of your capital. So with that said, I want to wish everyone a thanks happy Thanksgiving once again. We'll be back next week, um, more likely at our normal time on a Thursday, normal place. In the meantime, make it a great one. A lot to be grateful for. Bye for now.